Hi, my name is Andrea Valdez. I'm the editor in chief of the 19th and I'm here with Margaret Spellings. Um, Secretary Spellings, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you, Andrea. Really excited to have this conversation. Um, so I wanted to start with a question that I think a lot of parents are asking themselves right now. You have talked about um, keeping students in school right now. And there's a lot of questions we're looking at. Um, the pandemic seems to be a little bit on the upswing right now. And I think question, or there's questions from parents, how safe is it to be keeping our students in school right now? And you've advocated that this is something that we should be really thinking about in keeping students on campus. And I wanted to, to have you explain a little bit more why you think it's so important. Well, I don't think that that's a categorical statement. I think it really does depend on the situation of the individual student and the teacher and the classroom, the community, the disease prevalence, the health infrastructure, and on and on. But I do think we need to uh, be aware that this is not a, a zero sum situation, that are, there are real consequences when students are out of school. In fact, uh, you know, we've done some analysis and working with TEA that here in Texas, uh, we have uh, about a quarter of a million students who are, are, are lost, about six, enrollment is down about 6% in Texas. And that's a major, major uh, concern for policymakers and of course for families. So it depends, but uh, you know, I do think de uh, schools and school districts are demonstrating that they can uh, provide safe environments for students and teachers. And we're seeing more and more of that uh, around our state. That's a, yeah, that's great. And I'm glad that you clarify that there are some conditions and caveats to, to what the safety measure should be taken. Um, one of the other things that you've written about actually in an op-ed um, for the Dallas Morning News, I believe, that I thought was really interesting was talking about testing in schools. And I know that there has been just some questions about, do we continue doing testing right now in a pandemic when everything feels as though it's kind of upside down and, um, you know, school has just changed so much because of the conditions that we're in. And I thought you could talk also a little bit about the testing and why you've um, talked about the importance of maintaining some testing right now. Absolutely. I'd like to say we need to care enough to find out how our students are doing. You know, if you have a health condition, when you go to the doctor, they don't just start prescribing things. Uh, you know, they find out what your condition, the condition your condition is in. And, um, and, and that's still important. Now, I do think one of the hard lessons of COVID and, is that parents who are now more engaged uh, in many cases with their own students are seeing, uh, other, rather than get a report card in the backpack, are really having some understanding about how well their students do or do not read, how well their students do or do not uh, uh, you know, work with, with math or do or do not write well and so on. So. Uh, I think uh, there's some real benefit there, but testing is a critical part and always has been of education. And that is progress monitoring, finding out where our students are and getting them the help they need. And so speaking of data and information and collection um, of, of, you know, information on how our students are doing, you know, right now we're looking at the census that is um, you know, we're, we're drawing to a close there. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the census and just the importance of, um, you know, how that impacts funding for schools and what that means for our communities. And, you know, I know it's something that's been on people's minds as we're looking here through 2020 and, and the last 10 years and getting a sense of kind of where we are as a country. Well, Texas is a, is a real microcosm of our country. We're 29 million people or so today. We're growing and will continue to grow another 10 million or so uh, over the next 16 years into our bicentennial. And uh, we are at the same time getting uh, older and younger and more diverse. And so when we look at federal funding for education or for uh, our, our representation, uh, making sure that every single one of the, our, our uh, Texans, fellow Texans uh, who will be receiving services are counted uh, accurately and properly so that we can resource uh, our needs appropriately. Well, can we go to back to the diversity piece and just to talk about, you know, um, students who are, you know, kind of figuring out some of the virtual schooling, things like that. Uh, you know, do you have thoughts on what it means for, you know, there are different strata of students who, you know, might have better access to broadband or the internet or, you know, some of the educational resources they might need right now. And can you talk about just a little bit of, you know, what we should be thinking about with regards to the diversity of our, our student population and just making sure no one's, 
you know, falling through the cracks here? Well, a lot of students are falling from the cra- through the cracks and COVID has really laid bare the longstanding inequities in our systems of education. And broadband is but one example. You know, when, when uh, in mid-March, when we immediately went virtual in our state of, you know, 5.7 or so million school children, uh, about 1.6 million students did not have access to broadband learning uh, either because of devices or because of broadband capacity. And so that is a big number. And uh, those numbers are felt obviously most acutely in our uh, students of color and in our uh, uh, populations that, that lack the economic resources uh, in urban areas. Affordability of broadband is a huge issue. In our rural communities, just that plain old uh, infrastructure, technological infrastructure is an issue. And when we've looked at the early returns on the data, students who have access to broadband uh, and have you know, facility with that, have parents who are, who are often college educated and home doing their own work, uh, they have not seen much deterioration in their, in their learning. But in our, in our student populations, obviously that don't have access to those resources, uh, we are seeing really, really troubling uh, retreats and we need to address those uh, needs and issues immediately or it will predict a very dark future for our state and for them. Have you seen any creative solutions to try and provide broadband or provide some of these resources? I mean, I know libraries have been stepping up in a big way. Is there anything out there that you've seen that you think could be a model for how we could, you know, have this access for kids? Lots of innovation. And and in Texas, Mike Morath has has, uh, used a lot of the CARES Act funding to fill those uh, fill those gaps. Uh, local school districts, urban in particular, have purchased hotspots. They've distributed uh, devices, uh, ebooks, and so forth, uh, and have purchased tons of them. And so they've made real progress in closing some of those gaps, but there's clearly still more to do. You know, you hear the stories of the school buses that are parked in school parking lots and families uh, congregate in those parking lots with their children in the in their vehicles on their devices and so on. Clearly suboptimal learning, but but better than nothing. So you know you did talk a little bit about um, kind of at the top of the this uh, interview about some of the things that we should be keeping in mind. You know, trying to figure out what's best for my family. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you and I'm sure you've had people ask you. You know, people who have kids who are trying to figure out like what is best for my family. What are some of the things you know you had mentioned a few. Um, you know, caveats or considerations to keep in mind when figuring out what to do with your students or with your your kids. Um, what are some of the pieces of advice that you're giving out to people that you know or that you know you've been thinking about that have been front of mind for how to re-enter school safely or how to do virtual schooling safely and well? I mean, parents are especially mothers. You know, they're full-time mothers. Their kids want to be with mom. You know, like how how is it that uh, parents could be you know what questions should they be asking to make the best decisions? Well, starting with your own uh, health conditions, your students' health conditions and your family's health conditions. I think those are obviously foundational. Second, asking a lot of questions and learning a lot about what your school district is doing to keep your students safe. Uh, Masking, social distancing, uh, plexiglass, no lunches in classrooms, uh, Mm -hmm. temperature checks, cleaning protocols, uh, and, and those have, have become pretty ubiquitous. I think schools have been very, very responsible in, in, in that way. And then thirdly, obviously, what are the learning platforms? How well is your student adapting to learning online? Do you have that capability? Uh, do you have that high-speed uh, access? Or uh, you know, are, are, is your student better situated in, a, in an online, in a in-person kind of environment. We're seeing a lot of hybrids where school districts are trying to kind of split the baby. So one week they're in school uh, and physically, and then the next week uh, they're learning virtually. That's extremely difficult, challenging for teachers who are having to do two modalities simultaneously. Uh, but I think, you know, as I reflect on it in my own situation, in my own family, uh, you know, if you're willing to go to a, a movie theater or a restaurant, uh, but stop short of going to, to school, I, I kind of question that. I mean, what, what is your risk tolerance overall? Uh, because if you're going to, uh, you know, extend that risk, doing it in a school, doing it so your child can learn, so you can learn, uh, might be a place to do it. 
Yeah. I'm glad you brought up teachers. I'm curious to know what is it that you are hearing or, you know, what are your thoughts on if there's going to be a loss of teachers right now? I know that a lot of teachers who may have, you know, many years of experience, who maybe have some health conditions that they're, you know, concerned about in teaching during a pandemic. Are you concerned about a loss of a, or a teacher shortage or some loss of experience in the teacher realm of things? Well, one thing I, I, I'm seeing innovative school districts doing is understanding those conditions, those unique conditions of our teachers and trying to deploy our human capital in different ways than they might otherwise. So for example, I'm a 62 year old woman, let's say I have underlying conditions, but I'm the world's greatest lecturer on political science. And so maybe I should be the one that's beaming out virtually, not going into an in-person environment so that younger teachers then are working more directly with my students while I'm uh, taking the burden of that lecture and the preparation uh, from that teacher who's doing the, the you know, more face-to-face -face sort of model. So it's, it's requiring us to tailor and innovate around individual needs, both for teachers and students. Yeah, great. Well, so one of the things that I'm curious about, of course, you know, education is an ongoing, lifelong, you know, pursuit. And, you know, our students will be kind of probably dealing with some of the fallout of this particular acute situation that we find ourselves in. What is what is it that you are concerned about that might be a problem now in the pandemic that will see repercussions or ripple effects down the line? And what are so, some solutions to some of those issues that you're hoping that we can enact now so that we don't have you know, some of uh, what could be a really big problem down the line. Yeah, I hear it everywhere I go. And I have great uh, respect for teachers who are on the front lines of being the shock absorbers for that trauma that students and families are feeling now. It is real. And certainly it can be a, a growth experience as people adapt if we play that hand well. But but those issues are real and teachers are on the front line and the receivers of, of those signals uh, right off the bat. So I, I think uh, we need to make sure that we don't leave out mental health and, as part of the equation of back to school in a functioning way, uh, that teachers and parents are, are checking in with each other, either virtually or, or over the phone, so that there's that direct connection. Uh, this is causing teachers to really work triple overtime to keep uh, their sights on not only the learning, but also just the emotional and mental state of their classrooms. Yeah, and you've written about just the importance of educational systems as an institution. And I thought you could talk a little bit more about that too. And just, you know, what is it that we can and should be doing to safeguard these institutions, both from a community standpoint and maybe from a policy or political standpoint? Absolutely. And I think, you know, we've all seen and we have maybe taken for granted what the institution of our American public schools really mean to the functioning of our own families, our ability to work outside the home, but also our economy broadly, uh, the, the opportunities that women have had and have been facilitated by our schools and, and the various programs, after school programs and the like that go around that. And so it's a real wake up call for people to respect those, those institutions further they are places where people come together, whether they're through sports or through the arts or through all manner of activities where schools are the hub, where we learn to respect each other, to respect our differences, to be in conversation about politics or about our kids. And so uh, I think we're seeing uh, you know, the, the fraying of uh, those connections that are often brought to us by virtue of strong public schools. So as with all things, you know, we're living in polarized times and everything is a political issue to, or at least to some people's minds. And that would include education, which is not necessarily new, but I am curious to know from your perspective, are there some bipartisan efforts uh, on the, you know, policy level at the legislative level that you think are um, promising and that we could use to kind of underscore the importance of our educational system? You know, a couple of things really come to mind. First of all, broadband ubiquity is, is a must. And whether you're an urban uh, legislator who may be a Democrat or a rural legislator who may be a Republican, I think everyone sees the, the need to make sure that we have that full capacity for all of our students. And it's also critical, of course, for, for health and for commerce 
and not just our schools. So I think we will see some real bipartisanship at the federal and the state level on that issue. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm really bullish on this idea of, of a tutoring core where we know that you know we've got to address the potential for learning loss and we must do so safety, safely. We're gonna need assets other than just those overwhelmed teachers who are dealing with 20 or 30 students. So how could we harness uh, you know, our university students, our retired people, uh, volunteers that could work one-on-one -on -one with uh, our young uh, would-be readers uh, so that kids can get uh, the help they need in safe ways and that we can uh, make sure the future of our country is strong because those kids have what they need now. Oh, that's interesting. I had never heard of the, the tutoring core. Is that something, like you said, it would be volunteer. Would it be something where it'd be one-on-one um, -on -one or that students would sign up for it or that you'd have kind of feeder, you know, uh, you know it's just like an a university idea. to school? Yeah, it's just an idea that's really starting to get some traction. I've been talking with my uh, colleagues and, and uh, uh, predecessors, John King and Arnie Duncan about it. I know Sal Khan the, uh, is interested in it. So there's starting to be kind of a little bit of a conversation at the, at the policy level about it. And uh, I think it, it, it'll be an interesting conversation and, and something that we, we know we're going to have to put some assets against helping our kids get caught up. And we can't rely solely on our teachers to do that. No, and, and well, to go to the technology piece of things, you know, you talked about the importance of broadband, which, um, you know, I agree with, I think that that's something that communities are wanting and needing more and more of, you know, technology is interesting, right? It's, um, it's something that has helped us in so many ways and is good for us in so many ways. The same with data. Data is so helpful and it's informative and it um, illuminates and casts light on issues. But sometimes, you know, technology can lead us astray or data can show us, you know, uh, you know, things that maybe are, they look like a problem in the data, but they might not be a problem uh, actually. How do we safeguard ourselves against letting ourselves be too led around by the nose when it comes to technology? I mean, we're seeing that, I know that I'm here in an office situation where I'm on Zoom all the time and it's no substitute for being in person, right? Technology is great, it has really helped bridge the gap, but there's something that we still need about just, you know, person to person contact. You know, data, sometimes, you know, you, you think you're making a conclusion and the conclusion when you really get down to it might not actually be what's best for you, your family, your business, whatever. You know, what are some of the things that we should be asking ourselves when it comes to how we use technology and data correctly? Well, on the technology piece, I, th I think you're right. I, I think while we need to make sure that we're maximizing these, these tools and can do so uh, in smarter ways than we have, I mean, we've made more progress in the last six months that we made in the last, you know, 20 years prior to that in terms of using them and get becoming more facile with them. And we can refine that. And how do we think about that when we do have in-person learning and, and use that to augment and help students get caught up and maximize our human capital and so on. So I, th I think we're learning as we go, but people realize it is not a silver bullet uh, that we do want to and need to return to those relationships with our, uh, between students and adults. Uh, and with respect to the data, uh, you know, one of the things that is our middle name at Texas 2036 is our reliance on accurate, timely, publicly available uh, data that is proffered in ways that policymakers and the public can understand. And so, uh, you know, if you call the TEA or any agency and say, hey, I'd like to have this question answered, they'll send you a PDF of, you know, 75 pages and, and, and wish you luck. And so organizations like ours, I think, can take some of the friction out of that and make data and the use of it uh, more practical and more actionable for real folks. So uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was we're right now, at least here in Texas, we're in early voting. I think people are looking ahead to the elections. What and, and, you know, some of the elections that we're looking at are local elections, you know, of course, state elections, federal elections, and those are all important. But I'm curious, you know, there's going to be state district elections and state board elections. What are some of the things that parents and teachers should be asking themselves as they go into the polls and head into the ballot box, you know, with this on their mind? What questions should they be asking of their, um, you know, elected officials? Well, uh, it, very importantly, last session, the, our legislature passed House Bill 3, which represented a major reform uh, in, in our school funding system and also major investments for early childhood education and for 
uh, teacher pay and for bilingual education and extended school year and all of these critically important reforms that are were important then and, and much more so even now. And so uh, I, I hope that people will be asking their prospective representatives how they feel about education. Look, if you're in the state legislature, uh, you know, most of the budget is more than half of the budget is spent on public K-12 and higher education. So uh, it's the most important thing that our state does. So pay attention to those issues, of course. At the federal level, you know, we, uh, I think, understand that there's a real need for federal leadership, especially on things like broadband, especially on uh, issues around civil rights. The entire uh, uh, reason for the U.S. Department of Education grew out of the Great Society programs um, and, and a focus on, on equity. And clearly that's a critical matter before our nation and our students as well. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the last thing I wanna ask is, and I, I do wanna end on what I hope is a hopeful or positive or optimistic note. I think that there's a lot to be concerned about right now, rightfully so, but I'm curious from your perspective, what makes you optimistic with regards to education going forward, even if we're in a really critically acute, painful moment right now? We are seeing adaptation and innovation in ways that, that we haven't witnessed in decades. Uh, necessity is indeed the mother of invention and we're seeing a lot of that now. And uh, when in the aftermath of that, when, when this is cataloged and better understood, you know, what has worked with whom, when, uh, it will really help us uh, leapfrog ahead. Uh, and so I, I'm optimistic about that. There'll be some things that need to be left on the cutting room floor and the old ways of doing business and some real innovation and personalization and customization and uh, some things that will really help students improve their learning. And I'm, I'm bullish on, uh, on all of that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much.